All right. Oh, this is a funny sound. Um, this is not my real voice, but I think this is better. I can move around a bit and um, not so close, not so close. All right. So this is me uh, speeding up as an iOS presenter, learning while doing. Um, I'm here to, uh, to talk about speeding up as an iOS developer. Um, I'm working for a company called WeTransfer. Um, I'm curious, who, not, who knows WeTransfer? Who uses it? Um, basically, I'm working for a company in WeTransfer, which is the Collect app. Does anyone ever use the Collect application of us? So that's what I mean. We need to improve there a bit. Um, work in progress. What I like to do as well is um, blogging. I have a blog where I uh, try to post a blog every week on a Tuesday related to Swift, but as well related to your workflow, like how can you speed up. Um, I'm very uh, into those things. And as I said, it's not about speeding up as an iOS presenter, but um, I'm here to speed you up as an iOS developer. Basically, creating your optimized workflow. Um, I cover a lot. Hopefully, some of the things um, apply to you, and you can use that. And it's basically all about moving smoother. It's basically recognizing. Recognizing that a ball moves faster than a square. Pretty obvious, right? If you think about automation, which is a great part of this, um, it will often cost you a lot of time in the beginning. But in the end, it will pay off, and you will move faster. And for me, it all started with um, Stephen Covey. He has a book on seven habits of highly effective people. And one of his topics is sharpen the saw, where you would cut a tree, and if your saw is not sharpened, it will take you a longer time. So take some time to sharpen the saw, and you will cut the tree faster. To give it a bit more description, and um, I think we can all rely on the question, hey, we want to write tests. No, there is no time for that. Um, it basically means that you don't have the time to put on the wheels on the car and move faster in the end. And I want to kick off with an example which we use at WeTransfer where we basically create a unit test class. Very common example, and it applies to many different classes as well. And this is basically how it goes. You import your framework, which you often use. You get rid of all the boilerplate code, which you don't need. And eventually, you start writing the method name. Very simple. Oh, I went too fast, didn't I? Oh, no, that's good. Very simple um, example, uh, which you can improve very easily. You basically create your own custom template, and it results in creating a class and directly creating a method. And to give this some more specific idea what it does, and this was real recording, um, it's five times faster. So what I do in this presentation, um, I share you my learnings from over eight years of iOS development. And um, yeah, let's, uh, let's go through them. And the first thing, which you might not expect, but I think is very important, and that's feeling good. And to start with, I want to show you a tweet I posted a few weeks ago. And I asked who picks up his phone directly when he wakes up. So the same question for you. Who picks up his phone when he wakes up directly? OK, it's a bit less than the 80% I had in the tweet. But my thing is that often when you wake up, you pick up your phone, you see the Slack messages coming in, you see the emails coming in. Basically, you start browsing all the, all the data already. And your mind is starting to blow up. In my case, I have to commute like 40 minutes to the office and if I read a message on Slack and I couldn't answer it directly, I started thinking like, oh, I need to reply on it. I need to re reply on it. Don't forget. So basically what I try to do is I start my work when I can finish it. So I only read my emails 
when I can reply on them. I only open up Slack when I can reply on the messages. So I immediately get rid of it. And that makes me feel a lot better. Before you think, is this the WeTransfer application? Is that why nobody uses it? Um, this is me editing in Chrome uh, with uh, the inspector. But basically, it gives you an idea of a very bad performing application. And the first thing you would probably do, or could do, you start blaming. Who wrote that piece of code? Who did this? Right? But you don't solve the issue with that. And it's a very negative feeling which you drop there. So instead, what we try to do, we stay positive and we think in solutions. We try to fix it as soon as possible. And we take it as a team. You all did it, right? You posted the pull request, you got approved, so the code went through all your members. So it's a team effort, and you're going to fix it as a team. And with this, you feel better because you're positive, and in the end, you will fix the problem. So we feel good, then it's focus. And that's hard sometimes. And there is a very easy fix for that, which obviously not always works because you have to reply on messages. But if you try to create dedicated time in which you turn off notifications, you will immediately see improvements because there's no like common exit when you're busy. Basically, you get rid of any distractions. And I think we can all rely on this example. It's getting better, Xcode gets better, but especially with clean builds, it takes quite some time. And then it's very likely that you start looking on Twitter, opening up WhatsApp, go into Slack, read emails, and I bet that the build is finished before you return. And I was writing this presentation, and I thought, yeah, I need to give them an example of how to solve this. It turns out that's really hard. But what you can do is try to find a way to handle these times by, for example, using full screen, full screen mode with Xcode, and read the messages on your phone. That will at least give you an ID when the build is finished, and you will see that you much faster go continue in Xcode. Then there is the magic five minutes. Um, I'm going to show an example of a colleague. I showed the presentation last week. He didn't like it. Um, he felt a bit like dumb. But what I show in this example, um, often you get a question on Slack. And you can answer that directly, which will help, in this case, Boris to solve the issue. But the next time, he thinks, hey, Antoine gave me the answer very quick. Let's ask him again. And then, and then I start looking on the internet. So what I do instead, I wait five minutes, more or less. And most of the time, as Boris is not dumb, he's not sitting and waiting till I give him his answer. He starts searching on Google. He finds out how to set the background color of a view. He solves it and tells me, hey, no, uh, never mind. I fixed it already. And in general, that solves a lot of dependencies. And in the end, people will start fixing uh, things themselves. Then there is uh, dedicated time. Um, we're developers. We have to reply on things. But in my experience, I don't have to reply on emails directly all day. So what I do um, every morning, 10 AM, end of my story with emails, close the email application, and I don't open it the rest of the day. And that turns out to be a big, big win for me, at least, to get not distracted in any big task, which you often get in emails. And my colleagues start to recognize that pattern. They know, hey, my email will be answered next morning. It's already past 10. But once again, um, it could be that you need to reply on emails, especially with agency work. You have to reply on clients. Um, I guess then it's a bit harder. Same thing for pull requests. Um, it's often a step out of your flow to review a pull request so your colleague can continue again. But if you have a release train of, like, say, every other week you, you release an update, then the 
biggest deadline for that pull request is like a few days before that, so you can start testing. And you don't have to directly start reviewing the pull request to keep your colleague moving. You will start working on a different issue um, until you reviewed your pull request. At least that's my opinion. Um, they weren't angry on me when I presented this, so uh, and I think it works out, and it's another distraction you get, you get rid of. And I'm going crazy on this, right? So I even try to schedule all my meetings on two days. And this, this is the hardest thing of all the things I name here, but if you manage to do this, you will have two very full days, and you will be like burned in the end. But instead, you get like three days full focus without any, any meetings in between, except for the lunch. And your productivity on those days is, is very good. Um, but yeah, once again, it's really hard. It's not always your decision to plan a meeting, but you can at least suggest, hey, the meeting you just scheduled, uh, is it possible to do that on a Tuesday or a Thursday? And then I try to choose my meetings. Um, Sometimes you don't have to attend a meeting, especially when one of your colleagues is attending it already. Um, I try to trust my colleagues that he is able enough to uh, be responsible for the iOS part and I can just focus on my work. Um, and that's the other way around as well. So we feel good, uh, we're focused. Um, I will now start diving into a bit more tools. And first part is automation, because as the graph shown in the beginning shows you, automation takes time in the beginning, but in the end, automation will save time as well. And uh, probably the first thing you think of when we talk about automation, at least I did, is Fastlane, right? And Fastlane is a, a great tool. It, it can deliver you a lot of tools which help you um, create builds a lot faster, manage test flight, manage releases. Um, instead, if you look at our implementation, it saves us 30 minutes each run. And this is just one lane, and it contains a lot of actions, and those actions are all um, open sourced, the first lane is open sourced, and they all have their own responsibility. And if you browse through those actions, you can see that there are a lot of actions. Once you get, dig into Fastlane and you get to know the tool, you can obviously um, automate a lot and speed up your whole workflow. So if you didn't do it, I would definitely encourage you to check it out. And after that, next step, for us at least, was implementing a linter called SwiftLint together with Danger and that improved the automation in our pull request reviews. So often you do the same in the pull requests. You start like pointing out the same sp simple things, but instead you want to focus on the structure of the pull request and give direct feedback. So we've written our own rules on top of Danger, our own rules on top of SwiftLint, and they all come together in that nice comment which our bot does for us, which obviously saves a lot of time as the owner of the pull request can firstly fix the warnings and make sure the code coverage is enough. The creator of Fastlane is going crazy on automation, um, but it's just about recognizing, right? Um, he automated a reply to a recruiter. You can go as crazy as you want, uh, but again, it saves you time. He recognized the pattern and he started to write an automation for it. So we're automating, we feel good, we're focused. But what can you do yourself? What can you do with the tooling? And actually, it starts with knowledge. And I went on the graph tour, created one myself. Um, it's a very simple graph, but you get the idea. Once your knowledge grows, the number of searches on Google and on Stack Overflow drops. Essentially, if you have more knowledge, you will move a lot faster because you don't have to look up for the solutions all the time. So knowledge saves time, once again. And knowledge speeds up. And I think many of you have their own ways already. 
to gain knowledge. Um, but for the ones who don't, uh, I show you at least mine. And I start with the newsletters. And you have a lot, and I'm not going over them all. But I have at least two which I really want to read every week. And one of them is the Swift Weekly Updates. And it's a bit different than most of the newsletters because this one goes into all the Swift updates and is really dedicated to what's happening in the new Swift versions. It shows proposals, uh, what is going on, and also some really nice Apple blog posts every now and then. Um, it keeps me up to date, so when the new Swift version is there, I know at least what's in there. Another one is the iOS Dev Weekly. I think it's one of the biggest. Um, it's there for a very long time, and um, many newsletters look like this, where they sum up blog posts. And you will see many of the same blog posts across newsletters. Um, but at least it's an example. Try to find a newsletter which fits you, and uh, yeah, bring yourself up to date on the latest technologies and frameworks, um, where this is actually a really good one. And then there is uh, podcasts. As I said, I have to commute to the office for a very long time, and uh, I get a chance to listen to podcasts while I'm driving. And these are four examples. Um, there are a lot. I shortly go over them. Um, the first one is the Swift Over Coffee from Paul Hudson. Um, it's, I think, a special one compared to the other ones, where it really tries to involve the, uh, the audience, asking a question beforehand, and it really digs into opinions in the community. Whereas uh, Swift by Sindel is special because he really invites uh, people from different big uh, companies. For example, lately he had one from Pinterest, I guess, where they really dig into how they grown, how they did decide for uh, framework separation. And you can really think of yourself in the same situation and learn from that. So you have your knowledge, um, you want to apply that. So there comes the tooling. And tooling, in our case, is Xcode. And Xcode is very big, and you can do a lot. And over time, I learned more and more about it. So I'll show you some examples of Xcode, but as well, external applications which I use in combination with Xcode. And with that, you turn yourself in an expert on your tooling, because that's at least what you want. And before I dive into all the parts, I try to give examples. And I think every example can be digged into like for way longer. Maybe so you can use a talk for every part. But um, yeah, try to look back all the links. Uh, the slides will be online. Um, for example, shortcuts. I did a blog post on it. And if you start looking into the shortcuts, they will definitely improve your workflow. Um, for example, renaming a lot of properties. Uh, that could save a lot of time. At WeTransfer, we have a lot of dependencies, and we often have to search for a certain problem. And if you would search through the whole project, that would take a long time. So what we do, we create search scopes. For example, skipping tests. It's already a big win, because you need to look for the business logic, and it's not really valuable to see where whether a bug is happening in the test. Um, it's very easy. You can set them up very easy, and it will save you, once again, a lot of time. This is probably one of the things you would think of if you start speeding up as an iOS developer. Um, behaviors in Xcode. I was not really addicted to it, so I didn't have a lot. But this is one example which is very handy. Um, what you often have, you start debugging, and you have like the assistant editor open, and then there is a breakpoint with, which hits, and both the editors are certainly on that debug line. You're done debugging, and you have to go back to that state where you were. Instead, what you can do with this setting is when you start debugging, it will open a separated tab with the debug windows open. And you can simply close that tab and you're back where you were. Um, this will make you feel a lot better and keeps you in your flow, which is very valuable. 
Then there is something similar to code file templates. Instead, um, code snippets, which are a bit more generic, which you can use across several class types. Um, you can create them by selecting the piece of code and move them to your bottom right in Xcode, which creates a new code snippet for it. Um, it creates a lot of boilerplate code automatically for you. Um, then there is Xcode extensions. Unfortunately, we don't have Alcatraz anymore, but there are still very valuable extensions. Um, there's a link as well, which you can look up later on, which shows a big list of all the extensions available. Um, this is an example we use where it creates the boilerplate code for the initializer. Um, yeah, check it out. It's absolutely a plugin which works for you as well. Um, this is actually the second time I start uh, talking about Paul Hudson, but yeah, he inspired me earlier this year. So once again, uh, what he did was uh, a talk on debugging, and one of the things I found very interesting there was the use of breakpoints. Um, we used to use tools like Coco, Lumberjack with debug levels, uh, print statements everywhere while debugging, removing them before you commit your changes to, to GitHub. But you find yourself debugging the same part a week later, rewriting those print statements again and again. So what we do now is we create breakpoints with lock statements in it, and we keep them around. Um, you can even uh, commit them in Git, so you can share them with your team members, and you can just enable them whenever you need them for debugging a certain problem. In this example, we, um, we post the JSON response, uh, which is very handy. You don't have to open Charles every time uh, again, and you can directly see in your console which responses were triggered. And you can enable that while running your app already, uh, which is a benefit on top of log statements. We do have logging. We use uh, unified logging, which is uh, highly recommended by Apple to use. Fairly hard to start with in the end. Um, I try to explain in my, uh, in my best, uh, well, what you call in Dutch, Jip and Janneke taal, which may basically means make it very simple and understandable. And the benefit of it is uh, when a user comes to you in the company and tells you, hey, I got a weird bug, and it's a weird state. What we do, we connect the application, we open the console app, and we can directly see the logs coming in. And good to know is that um, these logs are visible as well for other people, but the sensible data you can mark as private, as you see, um, as the example shows here, where the sensible data will never show up in your logs, but valuable data will be there to help you debug um, a weird bug. Then there's debugging UI. Um, in the video, you will see that it's starting to debug the whole simulator. In the end, here it goes. And we have something that we transfer what we call shoulder beasting. Who knows what shoulder beasting is? I didn't know it before as well. Um, it's something from Sweden is what I've been told. But you sit down together shoulder to shoulder and you start digging into an issue. It's very simple, but um, this is the tool which we would use as an iOS developer with the designer where we would dig into the design and start implementing the changes he requested. I think not so long ago, a new tool was, uh, was introduced. It's still in beta. Um, I played around with it, and especially the part on the right is very valuable where it would get your view and starts to uh, resize it on the several devices. Um, this is something you have in the storyboard as well, but this is actually with the compiled view controller. Um, I can imagine that saves a lot of time eventually for us. Right now it's in beta, you can try it out for free, so I encourage you to check it out. On the left is the inspector where you would just select a piece in your app and you can di directly start making changes there. Um, in the end, you have to apply the changes yourself in code. That's still a missing part, but um, 
it's at least faster than changing in code, building again, changing in code, building again. This is um, an example of a few weeks ago where I was uh, implementing the design with my best sketch uh, skills. I pasted an image from Simulator and I started drawing drawers everywhere. And I would send this to the designer like, hey, it's starting to work out, it's almost there. Um, but you can imagine that this takes a lot of time. You update the simulator, copy the image again, paste it in Sketch, and you do that a few times until you're exactly matching the design. Instead, what you can use is the Flawless app. And it exactly does what you need there, where you can combine an image from Sketch and drag the border which you see in the middle and um, yeah, see whether there are changes in the implementation and the actual design. Exactly what I needed there. And then the last tip. Um, some other talks were discussing this as well, which is test-driven development. Um, it might be hard to do it, but you can at least do it for pieces, wh what we do at WeTransfer. Um, if we have a bug, we need to re write, uh, write a test for it, and the test needs to fail and reproduce the bug uh, just to make sure that it doesn't occur again. Um, that's the very beginning of test-driven development for us, at least, um, and I think you should be able to do that, at least, as well. So I want to tie back on the topics I just discussed. First up, um, it's feeling good. So make sure you feel good uh, when you wake up. Don't directly jump on, on the things you need to do. Um, keep the stress level as low, low as possible. Try to create focus for yourself. Get rid of notifications, distractions. Um, yeah, find your best workflow in that part. Start talking with your project manager, show the graph I showed before, and tell them that automation saves time in the end. Um, check out Fastlane, check out what you can do in your workflow to uh, gain speed. And knowledge, find a way to gain knowledge for yourself. Make yourself a better developer by reading blog posts and listening to uh, several podcasts. And um, yeah, maybe check out the slides later on find a reference blog post and read on it, and find the patterns which work for you. But in the end, it's all about recognizing those repetitive tasks, uh, because it could be different for every developer. Um, but I think in the end, we all have that moment where you could choose for the wheels instead of moving with the square wheels, which uh, don't really move fast. But in the end, speeding you up as an iOS developer, I hope something valuable was in there for you. Um, and I'm more than happy to hear any feedback on it so I can improve upon it. That's it. Thanks.